to Daniel chapter number 7 once again. We're continuing on with our study in the book of Daniel uh, and we've come to the, we'll actually be coming to the end of the chapter and finishing up uh, chapter 7 this evening and I want to call your attention to just that one verse there and then we'll be looking back as we go along through uh, a couple more verses also but notice with me the very last verse of the chapter, uh, verse number 28. Daniel chapter 7, verse 28, where, where Daniel writes, and he said this, Hitherto is the end of the matter. You notice that there? The end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my cogitations much troubled me, and my countenance changed in me, but I kept the matter in my heart. Think with me about that statement there. Hitherto is the end of the matter. Well, let's pray together. Lord, we do thank you for the reading of the Word of God this evening. And we pray now that you would speak to our hearts. And Lord, help us to learn. We, we understand. We know from the signs of all this happening around us that, that these are the last days. And Lord, you've given us warning of these days in the Bible. Uh, you've showed us what such days will be like, even days ahead even of us, even beyond this age of grace that we're living in now. And Lord, you tell us about the end of the matter. And so, Lord, we pray that you'd help us to learn, help us to be equipped to serve you. We'll thank you for all you do. And we'll pray as always for souls to be saved and lives to be changed and for revival to come. We'll thank you for what you do in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Uh, the end of the matter. I think all of us would agree, in fact, it'd be, uh, we could say easily enough that there is no doubt that we are living in the last days today. Can you say amen to that? Amen. You've studied the Bible, you've read uh, the prophecies in the Word of God concerning the last days. We, we know that we're living in uh, that time. This world is not going to last forever. Amen to that. Amen. I'm glad it won't last forever the way it is. Amen. This world is not going to last forever. God has an eternal plan and a purpose. And the end of the matter, as Daniel calls it here, the end of the matter is coming fast. It is coming on the scene quickly. Uh, Daniel is given a vision that greatly troubled him. He says so much as that there in our text verse in verse number 28. As for me, Daniel, my cogitations troubled me. It, it troubled him, this vision that, uh, that he's had. But in this vision, God reveals to Daniel what will be the condition of the world uh, uh, at the time of the end. And his vision contains both an awful warning and an awesome witness at the same time. We have the warning of the coming of the son of perdition and the entrance of the great tribulation period of time upon the earth. We have the witness of the coming of the son of God and the establishment of a great kingdom, a kingdom of peace that will last 1,000 years followed by a brand new heaven and a brand new earth. And so he gives us both a, a, a great, uh, an awful warning and then an awesome witness we have here in Daniel's vision in Daniel chapter number seven. And so think with me about this. There are three things that I want us to call our attention to this evening. First of all, we'll begin with the rise of the Antichrist the rise of the Antichrist, and then the return of the real Christ. 
I'd like to hurry up and get to that one, amen? The return of the real Christ and then the reward of the saints. And so let's look at these three thoughts this evening. First of all, the rise of the Antichrist. If you would look back at verse 7 and verse number 8, verse 7 and verse 8 in Daniel chapter 7, Daniel said, After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth that devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots, and behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man and in mouth speaking great things. Here we really have uh, an indication of the rise of the one that we call, that the Bible calls the Antichrist, this little horn. Understand it is not just one of the many uh, false Christ that, that Jesus uh, said would come forth during the last days and Jesus described in Matthew 24, Matthew 25 what the last days would be like and he said that there will be many that will be coming in my name. He said there's going to be false Christ. There's going to be false prophets. There's going to be false uh, teachers. And surely we've seen uh, such things in our lifetime uh, to, uh, today. And, and it's not just one that has a spirit of Antichrist. You remember uh, John, what he wrote in 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, where he said, Little children, it is the last time, and as you have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many antichrists whereby we know that it is the last time. And so it's not the uh, false Christ that Jesus was talking about. It's not the spirit of antichrist that is in, uh, in the world as we're living in uh, today. But what, uh, uh, what Daniel is referring to here is that antichrist. The one that John called that antichrist, the world's final dictator who comes on the scene when you read the book of Revelation, you find out he comes on the scene riding a white horse of peace, but it but quickly reveals a black heart of abomination. Uh, he is the devil's man. That's who he is. Amen. Uh, he's the devil's man. He is inspired and indwelt by the by Satan himself, and, and he, uh, he he's bringing uh, the entire world into his wicked scheme of rebellion against God. His rise to power may be very near, but hold on. The Bible shows us that there's a few things that have to happen first. Uh, we we can understand this. Uh, it's not going to come uh, as a surprise on us. We know that it is coming, but there's some things the Bible says is going to happen first. And, and one of these, the first one is, that is the return of the Jews to Israel. The return of the Jews to Israel would have, have to happen first. Did you know that for 400 years, the Jewish people had been dispersed throughout uh, the various parts of the world? And since the destruction of Jerusalem, which Jesus uh, told us, spoke of in Matthew chapter 24. The Jews had no homeland. They had no home. It was called Palestine, maybe back in those days. But there was no nation of Israel at all that was recognized by the other nations of, of the world. They had no home. And there are many passages of Scripture that shows that the Jews, in the beginning of these last days, that the Jews would be regathered in their land in the end times for the final events of the age to come to pass. And so none of it could happen until the Jews were back in their land. Well, in Ezekiel chapter 37, if you'd like to look back at the prophet Ezekiel with me, and I'm going to read quite a few verses there, uh, picking up with verse number 1. Ezekiel chapter 37, and beginning with verse number 1. And the Bible says this, The hand of the Lord was upon me, and carried me out in the Spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones, and caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord uh, God, thou knowest. Again he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. And thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. 
I will lay sinews upon you and will bring up flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and ye shall live and ye shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded and as I prophesied there was a noise and behold a shaking and the bones came together bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Then said he unto me, prophesy unto the wind. Uh, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came unto them, and they lived, and stood up upon their feet an exceeding great army. And what an amazing thing that is. But notice in the following verses how the Bible shows us uh, just really the interpretation of this vision of the valley of dry bones that God gave to the prophet Ezekiel. Because verse 11 it says, Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dried and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. You ought to mark that. Bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves and shall put my spirit in you and you shall live and I shall place you in your own land. Then shall you know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. Ever since the time of 70 A.D., when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem and destroyed the temple there, the Jews, by and large, have been dispersed throughout the entire world. And it was not until what we could refer to as, a, as modern time that we can say that Ezekiel chapter 37 and the prophecy of that valley of dry bones and the bones coming together and standing upon their own feet and being risen, uh, this prophecy has to do with the return of the Jewish nation back to the land in Israel that, by the way, it's Israel's land because God gave it to them, amen. And they returned back to that land. This happened in, uh, in uh, May of 1948, on the 14th, May the 14th of 1948, Israel was, was recognized as a nation once again. There are many Jews that came from, from Europe and from, from Britain and, and even Jews that would come out of Russia and other places. And actually still today, there are still uh, Jews coming from very, various places in the world and, and making their way back to the nation, making their way back to the land. This prophecy has been fulfilled and, and we saw the beginning of it in, on May the 14th, 1948, the return of Israel to the land. That had to happen. It had to happen before we could have the end times that Daniel is talking about here. And then not only do, we, uh, do you see before the Antichrist would rise that you have to have the return of the Jews to Israel, and we've got that. But there also has to be the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. We don't have that yet. There's been a lot of talk about it. Sometimes it's on the news. You may read an article or see, uh, see something on the television sometime about how that there are uh, Orthodox Jews in Israel now, uh, some of their rabbis and, and so forth. They're actually getting together uh, the things that they need to do the sacrifices in the temple. They're anticipating that third temple to be built. Uh, they're getting things ready for it. Uh, now, there's much that has been on the news in the past few years concerning the rebuilding of the Temple of Jerusalem, but it's not happened yet. You see, at the time of the rise of the Antichrist, there will be a rebuilt Jewish temple in Jerusalem. Many believe that it will be the Antichrist himself that will provide for the building of the temple when he first comes into power. And, and I really think along those lines as well. I think that's what's going to happen. I don't believe that we will ever really see, we will see that temple built in Jerusalem in our life. We may see the beginning of it. We may hear the, the plans of it or something like that, but it will happen. I don't think it will happen in our life. Uh, the time for the, uh, for the temple in Jerusalem will come during the tribulation period. 
because it's during the tribulation period that we can read how the, the, how the, the Antichrist will desolate the temple, uh, which will signal the last terrible half of the tribulation period that is called the Great Tribulation, or it's also called the time of Jacob's trouble. And Daniel spoke of this. Notice with me in chapter 9, chapter 9, verse 27. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. And this is talking about the coming of the, of the Antichrist. And, and it says this about, uh, about the Antichrist that, that is to come. It says, and, um, and, 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 well, let me read verse 26. It says, after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. That's the, that's the cross. That's the time of Calvary. That the Messiah should be cut off, but not for himself. And he didn't go to the cross just for himself, did he? He went to the cross for me, and he went to the cross for you. Uh, that shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people, here, here it is, the people of the prince that shall come. The people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be the flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And then it says, and he, that is that prince that shall come, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. For the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Now, what does all that mean? Well, when he says he'll confirm a covenant uh, with many for one week. One week, and we'll study this as we get on, move on over to Daniel chapter 9 probably in, in just a couple of weeks or so. But that one week is a period of seven years. It is a week of years, or it is seven years of time. And it says in the midst of that week, so three and a half years into it, he will cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease for the overspreading of the abomination. And, and Jesus said it like this. Here are the words of Jesus in Matthew 24, verse 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso, uh, whoso readeth, let him understand. Jesus spoke of what Daniel spoke about. And he said this in Matthew 24 when he was teaching his disciples, really answering a question that they asked him. They said, Lord, uh, uh, when will be the end and what will be the sign of your coming? And Jesus goes and he gives a whole list of, of things as we have studied already before. But he talks about how that in the tribulation period itself, there'll be this abomination of desolation. This will be the Antichrist bringing an abomination into the temple itself. You see, the temple has been built. They're having sacrifices there. And, 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 and I really think that it's best to understand it that that temple will be rebuilt when the Antichrist comes on the scene. Because think about this. Right now, in that temple, uh, at the temple, temple mount, what do you have? You have what's called the Mosque of Omar. You have that gold dome. And it is, it is, a, it is a, a property of, of Islam, of the Muslims. But it's right on the mount. They, they battle over that. Wars are being fought over that. Right in the midst of Jerusalem, which uh, thanks to President Trump is recognized now as the capital, of, uh, capital city of uh, of Israel, it had not been, Tel Aviv had been, but Jerusalem is now, just as it was in David's day in the Old Testament, and so it is now, but right in the midst of it, where the temple should be, you have a, a, this, this Muslim, this Islam uh, mosque. And so, and, and so there's, just, there's just not the way the world is set up now, there's not any way to build a, a Jewish temple there. Somebody was going to have to come on the scene and somehow or another bring such a tremendous change in Jewish and Palestinian relationships and so forth that a Jewish temple will be built there. How, how he's going to do it, I don't know. Nobody has been able to do it yet, and, uh, but there's coming one that is going to be able to do it. And the book of Revelation, as we already said, describes the coming of the Antichrist as one that comes in peace and he makes a covenant. He makes a treaty. He brings peace 
to the Middle East completely for the first time really in, in the history of the world. All that's going to take place with the coming of the Antichrist. But midway through that seven-year period, he reveals his true colors. He has this abomination. Some have speculated that, that he, he sets up a, uh, an image of himself. And we can read and study about that in the book of Revelation. He sets up this image. He got a ballot. Kind of reminds you about Daniel's day, about Nebuchadnezzar and the image and, and, and things there. Uh, the Antichrist will set up such a thing and, and you'll have to bow to that image and you'll have to take that mark of the beast and, and all those things we study about in the book of the Revelation. That's in that second half of the tribulation period or that great uh, tribulation. Some have speculated that what he's going to do is, uh, is go to the temple and declare himself to be God and sacrifice a hog, that is, sacrifice a pig or a swine as a, as a way of worship to himself. We know that the Jews, to the Jews, uh, a, you know, a pig or a swine, they don't eat pork. And uh, to them, it's an abomination. Uh, and so those words that Jesus uses, that abomination of desolation, it really fits some kind of picture like that. But he's going to be there and he's going to call himself God. He's going to reveal to the world just exactly who he really is. And so that's before he is revealed, these things have got to happen. There's got to be the Jews return to Jerusalem. That's already happened. But there's got to be also the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. That's not happened yet, but it will. There also has to be, before the Antichrist will rise to power, there will be the rapture of the church to heaven. I think we can be assured of that. Matthew, or, or 1 Thessalonians rather, 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter number 4. And you remember the verses, I like to read it, I hope you do too. Verse 13, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them, notice, in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen. Wherefore, comfort one another uh, with these words. The Bible tells us that God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation. And that ultimate salvation is going to be in that catching away, in that rapture of the church, where we will be brought to the presence, into the presence of Jesus Christ. Once that happens, then the tribulation period on the earth uh, can begin. We can speculate and guess just who that Antichrist uh, may be. And a lot of people have done that down through the years. There's been a lot of guesses. Maybe you've done that. I, I've done that. But I know that no one really knows the time when Jesus is going to come. And the thing about it is, according to the Bible, the Bible really says that Nobody will know who the Antichrist, who that Antichrist really is until he's revealed, until he's actually here. But he won't be revealed until that temple's built. He won't be revealed until the church is raptured. And, and so no one will know until after the rapture. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We'll get ahead of ourselves a little bit here because we're going to be in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 uh, next Sunday morning uh, in, our, in our Sunday morning services and our study of the Word of God together. But notice with me, let's go ahead and read it. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto Him that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. Now watch these words here. For that day shall not come. And when he talks about the day of Christ, he's talking about the tribulation period on the earth after uh, the rapture. That day shall not come except there come a falling away first 
and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So the man of sin, the son of perdition, he will not be revealed until after uh, our gathering together unto the Lord, as it describes it in verse 1 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the rapture of the church as is described in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It will only be after that that the uh, son of perdition or the Antichrist, Antichrist will be revealed. And he says, Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, there, understand, there's no temple right now. And so the Antichrist can't show himself until there is the temple. Because the Bible says here, he'll be sitting in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember you not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and now you know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time, uh, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked, then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the uh, brightness of his coming. Now watch this. When he says, then shall that wicked be revealed in verse number eight. He's referring back to verse six. Now you know what withholdeth that he that is Antichrist might be revealed in his time. The mystery of iniquity doth already work and that's happening today. It's such a mystery of how wicked that people have gotten in the world that we're living in today. The mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let. That's an old English word in our King James Bibles that means to hinder or to hold back. The word letteth and let means to hinder or to hold back. And so he who will hinder or he who will hold back, uh, he'll do that until he be taken out of the way. And so the key is, who is he? He has to be none other than the Holy Spirit of God. Because let's be honest with ourselves. What do you suppose is the only thing, the only thing in the earth right now that is literally holding back the full force of wickedness upon this earth. It's none other than the Holy Spirit. It cannot be anyone else. When will the Holy Spirit be taken away? He'll be taken away when we're taken away. He'll be taken away when the church, when the body of Christ is called up to be with the Lord because where is the Holy Spirit today? He's in you. The Holy Spirit is in me. The Holy Spirit is not some kind of, you know, some mystical thing. He's not another angel. He's not out there floating around. He is within the believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. So when will the Holy Spirit be taken away? Uh, it'll be when we'll be taken away. And so the Spirit of God, now the Spirit of God, then when we study the book of Revelation, the Spirit of God will still work, but not through the church. Because there's not going to be the body of Christ that have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But the Spirit of God will come upon people just as he did in the Old Testament. And you read those accounts and stories in the Old Testament. But he is the one that holds it back. It says when he is taken out, then the wicked will be revealed. So no one will know who the Antichrist really is until following the rapture of the church. So we can guess who it might be. We can think maybe it's, well, it's this one or that one or the, or the other one. And we can go naming names. I, I could make you a list if I took time to do so. You probably could too. I wouldn't be surprised if our list don't match a little bit along the way also. But uh, we could make our list. But the thing about it is, we, uh, we're, we're not going to know. And the truth of the matter is, we should not really be all that concerned about about not knowing who the Antichrist is going to be because if you've believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ, you've been saved, bought by the blood, you're not going to be here, amen. amen. You're not going to be here. You'll be in glory with the Lord. And, and so you see, it's so important to realize and understand. And we need to help people to see. And people need to know that, that look, if, if, if you would ever be saved, you must be saved now, amen. You, do, you can't wait till then. You have to be saved now. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2 says, Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Now watch this. Let me, let me uh, point this out to you quickly. Back in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, 
And we'll pick up where we had stopped off in, in reading verse number 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them, now watch this, in them that perish. The word perish would mean to die and, and, and to go to hell. In them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but have pleasure in unrighteousness. So what does that mean? You cannot understand it really by any other way than to understand that when the, when, when the rapture has taken place and if you're left behind and, and, and yet you have had opportunity to be saved, you've heard the gospel preached, God's given you that chance. You've had that opportunity, but you said no. You said no. You said no to the Spirit of God. You said no uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ time after time. The Bible says here, look, God is going to make sure that when, if you're left in the tribulation period, my friend, you will not be saved. God's going to make it so that you'll believe a lie or you'll believe the lie of the Antichrist. You'll believe the lie of the devil. That's why it's so important if you're going to be saved, you're going to have to get saved now. There are those, when you read the book of Revelation, that come to know the Lord. But if you study it carefully, you'll see that, that really what they are, they would be those in places around the world that, that did not in their lifetime have the chance and the opportunity that you and I have had. They didn't have the chance to hear the gospel. They didn't have the chance to understand the way of salvation. God will give them a chance in the tribulation period, he's going to have 144,000 Jewish evangelists preaching in the tribulation period. And uh, if you've ever seen a, a, a Jewish man that's a preacher that, that got saved, got born again, I mean, you, you, you'll see a fiery evangelist. You really will when you see one of them. And they're going to be on fire. They're going to be preaching the gospel. But, but if you had that chance, you were under conviction and you kept saying no to Christ, according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, listen, you need to get saved now. There is not, there's a very real chance, and according to that uh, text that we just read, uh, it's really pretty much, it, it's a sure thing. You're not going to get saved in tribulation period. You don't need to take the chance, hey amen. You need to get saved now. You need to get saved today. Today is the day of salvation. So, but these things have got to happen. There's got to be the, uh, the return of the Jews uh, to, uh, to Israel. There, there's got to be the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. There's got to be the rapture of the church to heaven for the rise of the Antichrist to take place. But then let's notice the second thing, the return of the real Christ. The return of the real Christ. Now, Daniel's vision troubled him. He saw the rise and the fall of world empires. He saw the rise of the Antichrist and the abomination that he will bring uh, to Jerusalem. And by his own testimony, we know that the vision greatly troubled Daniel. Back in verse 15, verse 15 in the chapter, I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit, in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head troubled to me. Verse 28 once again, Hitherto is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my cogitations much troubled me, and my countenance changed in me but I kept the matter in my heart. Daniel was very much troubled about this. Daniel saw some awful things in his vision, but Daniel also saw some wonderful things as well because his vision involved the awful warning of the son of perdition, but it also saw the awesome witness of the coming of the son of God. He saw not only the rise of the Antichrist, but the return of the real Christ. Can you say amen to that? In verse 13, he said, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven. Amen. You see, we can guess who the Antichrist will be, but I'm not looking for him, are you? I'm not looking for the Antichrist. I'm looking for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Philippians chapter number 3. Philippians chapter 3. And, uh, and verse number 20, Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20, listen to this. The Bible says, well, for our conversation is in heaven. Our conversation is in heaven from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We're looking for him to come, amen, 
Titus chapter 2, verse 13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 1, verse 11, you remember the disciples were gathered there. After his resurrection, Jesus took them to the top of Mount Olivet, gave them that, uh, his commission there in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, to be witnesses unto him in all the world. And then the Bible says they beheld with their own eyes, they watched him ascend into heaven and disappear uh, through the clouds. Two angels came and stood beside them. And they said to those disciples that day, this same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. We see the signs of the end unfolding all around us, but we need not fear. What we need to do is just follow the words of Jesus in Luke 21, verse 28, when he said, and when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Hallelujah. Amen. That's what we're to be doing, looking for the soon return of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so the return of the real Christ, you know what's going to happen? What's going to happen is there will be, first of all, the destruction of the beast kingdom. The destruction of the beast kingdom. Look back at chapter 9, or chapter 7, verse 9. Look back at verse 9. And uh, look at a few verses here. Verse 9 down through verse number 12. I'll read. Uh, Daniel said, I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set. And the books were open, and I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast, watch this, even until the beast was slain, and his body destroyed, and given to the burning flame, as concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. There will be the destruction of the beast kingdoms when the real Christ returns. There will also be the dominion of the Lord's kingdom. Verse 14. Verse 14. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. The dominion of the Lord's kingdom. And so you, in the end of the matter, you have the rise of the Antichrist, the return of the real Christ, but then let's quickly notice the reward of the saints. The reward of the saints. Verse 22. Verse, verse number uh, 22 in Daniel chapter 7. He said, uh, Daniel saw this, until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Did you see that? You know, you and I are a part of those saints. The time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Look at verse 27. Verse 27. And the kingdom had dominion, and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting com uh, kingdom, and all dominion shall, uh, dominion shall serve and obey him. It says that his kingdom is going to be given to us. The reward of the saints. Luke chapter 12, verse 32. I want you to think about this. The, today, right now, this very moment, the kingdom of God is in our hearts. You understand that? It's a spiritual kingdom in our hearts. God is not established. Jesus does not have his, his millennial kingdom, his thousand year He does not have his kingdom upon the earth right now. And we certainly are not living in a new heaven and a new earth now, neither. And so that's still yet to come. So today, the kingdom of God is in our hearts, but the day is coming. The day is coming. As Luke 12, verse 32 says, Fear not, little flock. These are the words of Jesus. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. That's what he's going to do. He's going to give it to us. And you know what that means then? That means what the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8, verse 17. 
that we, that we are indeed heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. All that is his is ours. All that is his will be ours. We are heirs of God and joint heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ. The reward of the saints, God will give the saints the kingdom. What an amazing thing that is. You know, the thing that comes to my mind is, is simply this. There's coming a day when no heartache shall come. No more clouds in the sky, no more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day, glorious day that will be. Amen. You know what that is, church? That is the end of the matter. Amen. Aren't you glad you're on the winning side? Amen. And I speak to someone that may pick up this message online. If you don't know you've been saved, you're not yet on the winning side, but you can be. And we sure want you to be. We pray that you would trust Christ and, and, and call upon his name to be Savior, Lord of your life, so that you can be ready for the end of the matter. Amen? Amen. Let's go ahead and stand together, our heads bowed and our eyes closed for prayer. Let's pray together. Lord, we do thank you for the word of God. We thank you that you give us the end of the matter. And Lord, we know that in this world, in, in this world today, right now, this very moment is very troubled. We know that by your word that it's going to continue to be troubled until that time that we will be caught up together in the, in the, in the clouds to meet you in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord until that day happens and then that seven year period of time will be upon the earth and at the end of that lord jesus you will be returning yes. you will set up your kingdom you will be seated at the throne of david in jerusalem and you will rule the world with a rod of iron and we your saints will be with you you make us you'll make unto us a, a kingdom of priests and we'll rule and reign with you according to the word of God. Lord, we know that we're not worthy of such blessing. We're not worthy of such reward. We know that it's only been made available to us by your grace and by the precious blood that you shed on Calvary's cross. So Lord, we humbly thank you for what you've done on our behalf. And we do look forward to the day when we will be with you in the kingdom. We'll be with you in glory. We look forward to that day. In the meantime, help us, to, help us to serve you. Help others to come into the kingdom. And Lord, we'll thank you for all you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. and amen. Let's we'll sing the song together, Brother Tim. Page 63.